Hi friends, Angelica Veneta, co-chair of Inclusive ICR. We are a coalition of over 220 employers in Eastern Iowa, all working together to grow the diversity and inclusion of our workforce, to create a space where employees feel a sense of belonging, included, and valued. Inclusive ICR is a proud sponsor of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion track of the Iowa Ideas Conference. As you participate today, be sure to connect with other Inclusive ICR champions, as we'd love to share information with you about our upcoming coalition meetings, projects, and how our work is impacting positive social change in our region. Be sure to check out our website at inclusiveicr.org for upcoming events and our e-newsletter. Thank you and have a great conference. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our last session in the Arts and Culture Track for Iowa Ideas 2022. In this session, we're going to explore successful public arts programs, partnerships, development programs that support the arts, and what the keys are to unlocking all those beautiful things. My name is Elijah Dishas. I'm a features reporter here at the Gazette, and I'll be your host today. You have a great panel today, and I want to give each of them a chance to introduce themselves. First up is Robin Anderson from Mason City. Robin, tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do. Um, hi, everyone. I am the president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce here. And the Chamber Foundation has really taken on public art as a way to um, impact community problems and um, from a placemaking strategy for workforce attraction and retention. So we work on murals, utility box covers, and we have a 80 um, sculpture, um, sculpture exhibit that rotates on an annual basis. Great, thank you. Next up, we have Tiva Dawson from Des Moines. Tiva, tell us about your organization and what you do. Good morning. I am the uh, founder owner of Group Creative Services. We're a public art consultancy based out of central Iowa. We help um, organizations uh, innovate through the power of art and artists. Um, my background actually is in government. I worked for 15 years with the city of Des Moines and then five years doing regional government work. Um, and I just kind of enjoy civic life and helping civic life be enhanced. And right now really um, believing in artists to be part of that uh, enhancement and innovation. Great, thank you. Third, we have John Engelbrecht from Iowa City. John, tell us about the work you do with Public Space One there. Yeah, I am uh, Executive Director of Public Space One in Iowa City. We are an arts organization that has been around for nearly 20 years. Um, we have uh, public in our name, so this topic is very uh, um important to us, obviously. Um, we we do a lot of different things. So we, we are mysterious to, to, to a lot of people and that's mostly because we, we kind of dip into all these different disciplines within, um, within art, um, but we're really a, a connecting node for artists uh, in you know, this part of Iowa and, and beyond. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be on this panel. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. We also have Matt Greiner from Des Moines. Matt, uh, what do you do in our fine capital city? Hi, thank you and good morning to everybody. I appreciate all of you taking time to come and um, have interest in public art. It's a vocation for me and I have been in my current role with as the executive director of the Greater Des Moines Public Art Foundation for five weeks, though I have been working in public art in different ways for over a decade. Um, here, the Public Art Foundation is both the authoritative body that approves and allows any art that is happening on public land, um, but we are also a commissioning body. So we typically have two to three smaller or mid-sized projects going at any given time, and at least uh, probably one larger work. We often work with artists of national and global renown. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have Nick Ludwig from Cedar Rapids. Nick, tell us about your organization and what you do in the lovely city of Five Seasons. Hello, uh, Nick Ludwig here. I'm the current board chair of the local Cedar Rapids nonprofit called Murals and More. We're a 100% volunteer group, uh, often described as a motley crew of folks that just want to see cool stuff in the city. <laughs> and uh, primarily responsible for uh, 
installations, uh, visual arts installations on public and private land, uh, working with those uh, appropriate bodies in between, uh, been around for 10 years. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, I want to get into all the great stuff you folks have going on, but um, before I do that, I wanna figure out where we are in the map. Um, so first, tell me about the role public art plays in Iowa today and why it's so important to our state. We shouldn't be shy. Uh, <laughs> I'll kick it off. It's so important. Uh, when I when I think about public art, it it really boils down to a couple things. But but one of the most obvious is the idea of a, a strong ecosystem of artists. And um, whether you're working with folks that grew up here and live here and, and are practicing artists uh, in our in our communities or, in, or across our state, um, that's great. But but there's also of course tremendous value in in bringing in uh, folks of world renown or or that that are you know do a phenomenal job um, to help influence and inspire um, the, the phenomenal uh, artwork that we want to see in our communities to, to benefit the public good. Um, uh, hopefully that helps kick it off. The, the benefits everybody. Uh, there's so much you could talk about. Absolutely. Robin, you touched on placemaking a little bit. I think you certainly would have a lot to say about, about this. Tell me what your take is on, on the role public art plays in Iowa today. Sure. Um, competition for talent is so fierce and people really care about um, the places that they live. And so public art is so important to workforce attraction and retention. Um, now with people being able to really choose um, much more um, where they work from, um, competition is getting stiffer. <laughs> We all need to make sure that all aspects of um, art, not just, you know, the visual arts, but, you know, certainly music and theater and dance um, are very important to the kind of talent that we want to attract to Iowa and to all of our communities. Absolutely. Yeah, I, so I'm going to chime in, sorry. Um, you know, I think uh, for for me, it comes down to a really basic thing about uh, public art is is how we as a community and as people express kind of our our greatest you know perspectives on 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 life and that sort of thing. So Iowa, uh, if it's if it's going to be a state that's very forward looking with um, the the people it attracts and and the opportunities that it gives, um, should reflect that in the vibrancy. Of its of its public works, um, whether they're murals or other events that that happen in whatever commons we we have 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 left here. I I can maybe add to that in um, the public art seems to really be having a moment in central Iowa. It's gathering steam and demonstrating its capacity to like connect people and really we keep having more successes. Um, more work happens and more people get excited about it. I'm thinking of, um, I think one of R Robin and I shared a colleague in Eau Claire who oversaw a sculpture walk and during the pandemic year, they found that in their chamber of commerce business um, searches for Eau Claire, Wisconsin that were looking for things to do, reasons to visit, or reasons to move there, their traffic for their sculpture walk outperformed every other aspect of their website by like three or four to one. It was really astonishing. And so we know that people are looking for places that have the capacity to thrive, which we can see because there's active community happening in public spaces. And, uh, Absolutely. I would just concur with the rest of the speakers. People are attracted to places of beauty and a place that you have a sense of like, there's things to do and I have something that I can plug into. And that's how Iowa thrives in the arts and culture um, are really a key facet of offering that as sort of key components of why people wanna live um, in, in a certain community. For sure. You know, a lot of us think of public art as something that's, you know, pretty and, and maybe nice to have, but I, I don't think many of us have the frame of mind that 
um, public art is a problem solver. Tell me what, what problems public art is solving in our communities today. Well, I can give an example. Um, any direction that you enter Mason City's downtown core from, um, you're greeted by sort of the ugly backs of buildings. And so we've really used murals to beautify, but um, also as a way to build our brand as a destination for art and architecture. And um, it's amazing, um, even from, from outsiders, you hear a lot, but even from people in the community, they were like, I never noticed how ugly that vista was before you made it beautiful. I think during the pandemic, we lost a lot of our sense of public um, connectedness, a sense of social cohesion. Um, so many of our public institutions just kind of went away, access to libraries, community centers, schools. And I think we're still, when you look at things like suicide rates and homelessness, we're still having to reweave um, that sense of social connection where people feel like they have a sense of belonging. And the public spaces are our places to do that. And public art and artists, whether it's temporary or permanent, are, I think, the key activator um, to reweave that. Um, I also, two, two specific examples, um, we did a temporary art installation in downtown Des Moines, highlighting the issues of youth homelessness. So really, you know, again, it was temporary, it was a splash, but it was a, it was a chance to activate hearts and minds in different ways. Um, the second one is right now we're proposing artists to help re-envision the mascot for Indianola. They still have the Indians, um, Indianola mascot. And um, we think that artists can say, what could we move towards rather than um, trying to get people to say well, what we're losing is what can we reimagine for our future? Those again are issues of race and inequality. I think all of those are issues in which artists should be central in the civic discussions. Absolutely. I, you, can, I, you know, go ahead, Matt. I, I was going to say that um, I, artists, by their nature, are prone to find novel solutions, which are then almost inherently distinctive and add distinction and innovation to the communities that support them. So it, it's exciting for me not only to have public art uh, entering and connecting people, uh, creating new discussions. But it's also exciting when artists are allowed to help frame that conversation or discover their ways through some of these things because they often create enough of a novel perspective that it gives us a reason to come together and question and understand some things. And kind of on the heels of some of the, I, I believe a lot of the problem solving flows directly into the ways in which public art has good impact and provides more thriving communities. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and I know John and Nick, you you guys do um, quite a few murals. Um, I, Nick, murals is in your organization's name, so that's obvious, but um, it, it, murals have a tendency to, yes, they, they cover up blemishes, they are pretty to look at, but what else do they do in, in Iowa City and Cedar Rapids? Sure. Uh, yeah, the, the idea of some identifying mark in a, in a community goes a long way, I think, for uh, Tiva touched on the idea of social cohesion and uh, helping a community find an identity. And there's there's you, can, you can't fake it. You know, there's a, a place is what it is. But but artists that are there and, and people that rally around an idea that an artist can present, uh, I think, is really powerful. And. When, when you have a successful uh, you know, art installation that, that truly can, uh, you know, I don't know what the biology here is, but pe people are more alike than, than different. And we, nobody remembers that, you know, any, <laughs> we have so many problems and the idea of social cohesion is just, I, I feel like it's a, it's a major issue across not just Iowa, but many parts of our, of our nation and our world. And what, really inspiring and compelling artwork does and and not not all <laughs> public murals do this but a really good one can can have a powerful effect of of helping a community feel a little bit whole 
And, and sometimes it can be uh, a compelling narrative uh, on maybe a controversial subject, uh, but, but it doesn't always have to be. The, the good ones do a really good job of, of, of mixing that and helping people rally around something. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I would I would add um, it it may it may not always be the good ones that do that do that. Like so, sometimes uh, you know we have there's there's murals some that I've been involved with some I haven't that happen in Iowa City and there and there's as everyone on this panel probably knows anytime you do an artwork in the public it, there's there's some level of of controversy over it whether it's the amount of money being spent on on the thing or whose vision gets on the wall and whose vision doesn't um but it, you know kind of kind of a side note you know there there's a mural in Iowa City that is very large and 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 it looks like the friendliest cutest thing you've ever seen and i know for a fact there was controversy around that even and uh so uh, you know I, I think that um but but that's in some ways it's good to have that because it means that people care about how they're represented as a community on these on these walls and and um which isn't to say that you know we should we should be funding bad art uh, as as murals but um that more people should be involved in um coming to these processes where these decisions get made because most of the time there there is a process um especially when it's going on uh very public spaces and and not just privately owned um, walls um yeah so I'll throw that out there. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, I wanna give you all a chance to elaborate a little bit more on the partnerships and initiatives um, your organizations are involved with. And while you're at that, tell me how you've seen the appetite for public art change over the last several years. Matt um, alluded to public art having a moment right now. And I wanted to hear more about that. So Matt, let's start with you actually. Yeah. Uh, well, in in the Des Moines area, I, I, I have, I'm privileged in that I've actually recently been in several different communities around the Midwest in the last uh, several years. And so I've seen that this is true, uh, just happening all over. But here in the uh, city of Des Moines, we've got some very able funding mechanisms that are always working to adapt themselves to meet the need and the appetite. And more and more, we see not only that in the city center, but in particular the, the suburban areas, the areas that are growing, um, even some of the rural outlying areas are just discovering that they have an appetite for public art and where there is a little bit of help to pay for it, a little bit of inspiration, some expertise to guide the project and, man and manage risk for people. I think that's a big thing that is helpful. Um, the appetite is just growing and growing because the more people have it, the more they want to, they see that they want to live with it. They, they want this to be a part of our lives and they see how uh, it can change communities, both in terms of how it feels for citizens, but also again, of course, how it uh, contributes to labor recruitment and retention and just having a great quality of life. Absolutely. Robin, I've heard some exciting things um, happening in Mason City. Tell me what all is happening up there with your partnerships and your initiatives. Um, well, I guess what I'd really like to share is that, you know, these public art installations um, also help to attract investment and development. You know, we have a case here we hadn't had um, a multifamily housing development in Mason City in years. And a uh, housing developer came to Mason City sort of checking out, you know, Midwest communities. And when he saw our public art, he felt like he didn't need to look anymore. He felt like if this is a community that invests in itself and cares about its presentation, it's the community that he could be successful in. So he opened a 123 um, unit housing complex and we are breaking ground on phase two. Um, I think it's another 90 units on October 27th. And he chose Mason City because of our public art. Wow. Well, I, something that I've been on the verge of sharing a few times that uh, really fits with that is 
where I see communities that are afraid of public art or um, shying away from the investment, the contra potential controversy, or just the con other forms of risk that any new effort may come with, it also seems like there's then an investment in the status quo, where communities and cities are trying to grow and uh, attract greater tax bases, all the things that cities need to do to be successful. They need to have a certain growth mindset. And I believe that shying away from public art, shying away from bolder investments in public spheres, even if it's like civic infrastructure, focusing on maintenance is not a growth mindset. And in the competitive spheres that communities are in, if you're not growing, you're at a grave risk of decaying. And that it's kind of a cold water sort of moment, but that is what I believe I've seen. And it plays also to communities being, um, it's just really crucial to be deliberately open and welcoming to diversity and to culture. And failure to do so is can have some pretty long-term, maybe even negative effects, I believe. Yeah. Elijah, you mentioned sort of key partnerships in making some of these uh, successful. And I think it was really interesting. We had an artist that we work with a lot in Des Moines that recently did a project, I think with Public Space One and was in Iowa City. And so it was really interesting for him to contrast doing artwork here versus just a town a little bit further away. And he's like, it's so different there. And I said, it's probably because of funders um, or more conservative community funding. It's probably coming from more corporate places. Maybe it's with a university setting. There's you know different sources of funding. And so it was interesting just to watch that sometimes who's asking for projects and where it's originating really does help set the tone for how brave artists can be and how expansive they can be. So I think that that in terms of partnerships, the funding really does like where the funding is coming from, it does matter in terms of how far open the door gets to be. For us, we found that sometimes government is while it's in public spaces and government tends to fund those, they're not the most brave when it comes to public art. Um, they want things that I think generally just adornments. Um, but where we've had luck is working more with community development agencies, those that are working in spaces to enhance communities and neighborhoods, and especially kind of getting out of traditional downtown spaces where things tend to be really big and splashy and working into neighborhood spaces where they're really trying to, again, weave fabric of, of community connectedness and rejuvenation. Um, and then, you know, just folks who are looking for new ways of doing things, whether it's just a new way of doing a donor wall, like folks who are just up for creative areas. And that isn't always a clear path of like a certain type of funder. It's just continuing to find people who are willing to try new things. Yeah. Um, just want to take a second to remind our audience that um, they are free to submit questions here. And um, some of them apparently knew that because we have some coming in. And so I want to go a little bit deeper with what you just said, Tiva, um, a question from Matthew Doty is how much funding assistance comes from Community Reinvestment Act sources? Like it's saying like ARPA funding or those sort of like government funding sources is that the question, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm Are not sure either. I was hoping you might know what that means. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's well, two. Community Reinvestment Act um, actually has a lot to do with um, banks and financial institutions. Um, so um, if, if that's the question, I would say in my experience, and I was a banker for 20 years, um, not much. Okay, interesting. Um, along a similar line here, the, the next question is, Public art requires collaboration between artists, cities, um, governments, businesses, a lot of stakeholders. How do you all navigate those relationships in a way that retains the vision of the artist? Is it is it hard to keep everyone happy? You can comment on that. Um, the and and yeah, short answer, yeah, yeah, it is. It's really yes. hard. Um, <laughs> um, but now the but long answer. Yeah, <laughs> the exciting. It's that's what's exciting about it, and the the. The best equation is when you find a wall with no conditions or, or a space, I should say, generally, uh, and, and you find money and, and then you find an artist. Now, the, the times that that happens is, is almost you know nil, but 
to have um, interested and engaged people along the way that are the, the primary thing to, to remember is that the artist uh, or artists in, in some cases, uh, as long as you have a, a, a general consensus of, of potentially the faintest idea of a direction, you're going, the, the project is going to be more successful with, with less interference. And the, the more upfront, and in my experience, the more upfront that you can be with, with the, the stakeholders involved uh, to be compelled by that idea to allow an artist to have this canvas, uh, it's, it's in every instance I can imagine, um, it's, it's worked out better. Um, and, and it's been a more exciting process and that, that the artist will also feel more <laughs> uh, uh, rewarded by, by the scenario to be able to, to speak their truth through, through the form of their art. Yeah. Um, but I would encourage people not to shy away from controversy. My experience has been that controversy over um, subject matter actually builds champions in your community and will usually right. cause people who might not speak out to say, you know, hey, you know, I really like that. Or I think people, you know, should have the ability to do different things. I know um, we do a people's choice competition for our sculpture walk and the city purchases the winner of that competition. And every single year, every single sculpture gets at least one vote. So to me, that means that, you know, someone's favorite or the one that someone hates the worst is somebody else's very favorite. And that's what we all love about art. Yeah. One thing that contributes to this, you can mediate some of this by having a good, well-established process, making sure that you're deliberate. If you have selection, I, I think the design of the opportunity, how that's, if it's going out as a call to artists, how you solicit and find the artists who are right for the project, that requires a certain amount of um, thinking and diligence. And then I, I think it's really important to make sure that you have the right stakeholders as part of your selection committee. There will be, uh, haters are going to hate. And there's going to be at least one for every time. But to make sure that the people whose voices are, you know, the ones who are really being impacted by the work and those who have a stake, make sure that they're a part of the selection process. That goes a long, long way. And it's also a great way to activate different parts of your community to connect there and possibly yeah. also to blend some of your You know, that's an interesting point, Matt. Which, which stakeholders, I'm curious, um, are, are the most difficult to get to the table, if any of them? I think maybe my first, my gut reaction to that question is that it's, it may be just that the, the person administering the process needs to be willing to go outside of the people they already know to make sure that the right people are involved in the selection process. I don't know that there's any group or type of uh, potential stakeholder that's difficult to persuade to come and be a part of. You know, in one way, you know, offer a lunch, and tell them that they get to look at pictures. <laughs> it's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> in, one, in, sorry, go ahead, John. Yeah, sorry. One thing I would just kind of throw throw into this conversation, and this is a tenant that um, Springboard for the Arts has long held, which is to involve uh, involve artists earlier in the process, or involve artists, you know why aren't there more artists at uh, some of these tables when when these projects are even being brainstormed and in you know whether that's a, a city meeting or um, or you know a company or or whatever that thing is involve artists early even even if it's not the artists who are going to do the thing if you have that perspective in these meetings as you go into it I think there's a much uh, better chance for success and and also you should pay them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are the, the most important elements for um, developing sustainable partnerships? We've had, we've had really been very fortunate to, uh, our entire organization is, is uh, relies on, on the partnerships that we've developed. Um, 
navigating between public space and private space has been, I'd say, challenging for our group in that, um, you know, obviously it's a very different animal uh, from a process perspective, um, which is almost funny though, uh, most people, community members, visitors, won't really differentiate the two. Um, anyway, but uh, f between developing uh, relationships with, with funding partners, um, Cedar Rapids has, has a great setup in terms of uh, sort of the neighborhood districts that we, uh, that we have. Um, and, I, and I wanna say at this point, it's, it's just about every one of them has now uh, in, the, in the, the last, maybe I'd say three years or so, invested some amount of money in, in some public art in, in their own neighborhood. Uh, and our group has been involved in some, not all. And so shifting into almost a, a resource gr uh, group in, a, in sort of a consultative way where we can help um, make connections and, and show people the way. And, and then most importantly, remember, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mission, it's a little aligned with our mission to have a group that's not us doing something like this as well. It's a very positive thing. And so the demand for, for uh, this type of work in public art generally in our community is echo what Matt said in Cedar Rapids, there's a, there's a huge appetite for it right now. And um, even just from a commercial perspective is, so we're, as a nonprofit, it's, it's sort of outside the scope of our nonprofit's organization, but we, we receive many uh, requests for the, the local pizza shop to do a mural of the pizza and the beer and the whatever, you know, it's, and that's not what we're going to do, but it's just, it's exciting. And um, anyway, so from a partnership perspective, uh, being there, being present, and then being, I'd say, generous uh, from a from an information perspective, to try to raise and elevate uh, the, the the community's appetite for this as a whole, um, and and not being guarded or uh, egotistical about it in a way of somehow the idea that uh, one group or another group should or shouldn't be involved um, for a reason or another. Mm. I'd add that just. Trust. I mean, I think when you're looking at what makes effective partnerships, you know, Nick really spoke a lot about just relationships, right? Like a lot of these things are about relationships and people trusting inherently with public art. Ideally, you are taking people to places they haven't been before, right? We, we believe that with creativity and problem solving of artists, they're stretching us into new places. And you just need, you know, from partnership side, people who trust you as individuals and your work, as well as the process, um, and and believe in that process, and having having a deliberate process, I think is really helpful for those partnerships to move forward. Um, so that when things go wrong, you really are there starting from a not wrong, but just when things get difficult, you're you're going back to a base of a, of a relationship there of trust, and not just a transactional experience for folks. Yeah, and our, trust. Sorry, go ahead. Has sort of been our um, strongest partner but it took the longest time to cultivate. And so I would say for communities interested, um, start small, work on those relationships, let people get comfortable and they'll be very generous. And a lot of times the traditional arts organizations, I mean, our art museum board was very suspect of our sculpture program and they were very concerned that they would be sharing donors with us. And what happened is um, the biggest supporters of the sculpture program were never on anybody's radar as supporters of the art. And we haven't had any conflict at all. But, you know, it was scary for everybody starting out. So I would say, you know, start small, start slowly and you can be more bold um, once you've earned some strikes. Yeah. Do you think that kind of goes to show that public arts is not necessarily a zero sum game? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, I think there's something there with the, uh, you know, uh, kind of scarcity versus abundance mindset mm -hmm. It's when, when, you know, you start a new program and people are in this competitive mode, oh, they're going to take my donors or that sort of thing. Like, I, I feel like, and I don't have any data to back this up, but I just, you know, most of the time, if you're supporting each other, you're growing a potential donor base, you're growing all this stuff. And um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, our, our for, for us at Public Space One, and this is one of the reasons we've been successful in the 20 years we've been around is, 
we don't see ourselves as the only game in town. We want to elevate everyone who comes through whatever art exhibition is happening. We put it out there on our social media because we want this community to grow and not just us, you know, and it's about this, this vibrancy. And I think that goes, uh, you know, that's, that's a mainstay for a lot of what we're talking about in these um, community based public artworks. Mm -hmm. We, we've often said more is more. And I think it's, you know, some of our earlier conversations were that there is, we get a little taste of this. We see how great it is. We want to live with public art. We also recognize that if this group is doing public art in this way, and this group is doing something else, that means we get, we're in the, the one of the greatest contributions of having public art in your community is that it adds vibrancy and difference. So of course you want each of these. It's just like if there was a certain type of restaurant and a second restaurant that served similar cuisine opened in your town, now you've got two choices for how you want to eat a hamburger and that's really good. So I can, like, um, just quickly, if, if everybody on the panel agrees with what John just said, we can raise our hands. And now John has data because five of five public <laughs> art experts <laughs> Thanks for that, Matt. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I want to go a little bit deeper into that that vibrancy you raised, Matt. Um, you know, we've all seen the headlines about Iowa losing young folks to the brain drain um, at one of the highest rates in the nation. We've seen headlines about rural Iowa um, bleeding its population into urban areas and, and other states. What role can can public art play in positioning our state for a stronger and, and, and a more competitive future? This is huge. Um, and I, I think it starts honestly with having a statewide ecosystem of artists. And uh, that foundation, which I don't think we're particularly well, currently doing a phenomenal job. I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and, and I think about, um, artists uh, by nature uh, attract people and the whole idea of their work. And, and of course we're living in a global economy. So this isn't necessarily as localized as it maybe was, you know, some number of years ago, but um, the idea of being able to have folks in your community that can inspire other people in a myriad of ways uh, is, is just so important. But, uh, and, and then it trickles down to the idea of, I hate that I just used that word, but the idea of, um, <laughs> of, of, having things for people to do and see. And then, and that's where the, where, that's where the sort of the com community vibrancy and the, the ability to have, uh, I think workplace retention is important and, and uh, communities that are exciting places to be. And it's, you know, my little organization is, is just one tiny part of that. You know, you think about the theaters and the, and the music halls and, and venues that have music in any way. So, um, but, but I think it starts with the people that are going to be there to do it be paid a living wage to do it and and ha have folks in your communities that are that are the the, the innovators and the shakers and the movers and, and the, the the weirdos that want to make amazing experiences <laughs> yeah. well i think leaders you know we hear a lot about the need for housing child care you know um educate funding for education keeps shifting i mean that really was a cornerstone for what attracted people to iowa for a long long time and those, I think artists have to be in those conversations. They need to be part of sparking conversations around those key issues and part of problem solving um, to address issues of housing and childcare. And, you know, the, those that they're, they're not, you know, to create beautiful places and distinct places to live, but also part of addressing our civic concerns. I think we're, you know, any of us will recognize that we've, are more likely we will be happier living and working in a place where we feel welcome and connected, where we feel like we are uh, having the things to do that we want to have for our lives. And uh, it's maybe important to see that we are often, it's easier to measure and get quantified information around how many people say want an artificial turf soccer stadium or something. But of all of the thousands of people who want to go see soccer, I have to believe that quite a few of those people would also like to have some art experiences or a unique dining experience or what have you. We can become so focused on 
the one thing that is easy to measure about how to grow our communities that it's easy to forget we're all multidimensional people who have a great many interests. And until several of those touch points are engaged for us, that's what we need in order to really feel like we're at home. And then perhaps we don't move to other states. Yeah, and, and Robin, you're probably among us, you're the closest to rural Iowa being in Mason City. Uh, tell us how big you see, um, how big of a role you see that vibrancy playing in, in growth for Mason City and the surrounding area. Well, obviously, it's, you know, a lot of things um, that impact growth. And so we're trying to do a, a lot of, you know, little things. But I also think I'm not a big fan of mandates like making developers, you know, use a certain percentage of their development costs for landscaping. Um, but I think we could do a lot to share with um, developers that our culture is that we appreciate public art. And so if you're making uh, you know, an investment in our community, um, we really recommend that you, know, you pay attention to architecture style because that's part of our culture. We recommend that you include some public art components um, in your development. And we have all these different resources that can help make those decisions, point you in the right direction. And We've had a lot of luck um, with that, with building owners and others who just really didn't know where to start. And so it's sort of on us to um, invite them to include those kinds of things. Um, I feel like if we were mandating it, um, they'd be more concerned about the finances of it than um, inviting them to participate in the culture of the community and making sure that they know that um, art's important to our community. Yeah, and re remind me, Mason City is one of the biggest cities in Iowa for architecture, is it not? Um, Condé Nast Traveler named Mason City twice one of the best cities for architecture in the whole world. In the whole world, oh, excuse me. In the me. whole world. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's well-deserved, I'm sure. Um, what are the biggest challenges or, or barriers to success in public arts programs and partnerships? Uh, well, I think one, one thing, and this kind of goes back to what Nick was saying, um, especially in Iowa, is how, how do we grow that body of of professional or or artists capable of doing some so one one of the challenges that that we see um, is that um, there's only you know uh, whatever handful of people who have the experience to execute some of these public artworks and 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 thus we're bringing in um, you know companies from other states or other places uh, to do these big public art projects when um, you know we have, the knowledge and we have the connections, we just have to make them uh, to to train people to do some of this work, you know, best practices for mural making, best practices for public structures and that sort of thing and and kind of grow. So so to me, I see that as a as, you know, it fits into the the brain drain um, scenario. Like how how do we use, you know, these these various um, you know, nodes that we represent here to further strengthen this from a really, you know, a, a kind of a base level and up um, scenario. So that that's one thing I would say as a challenge, particularly to to Iowa, who who, you know, there is an appetite for some of this work and then often it gets farmed out to other other places, which I'm not saying we shouldn't bring in artists from other places by any means, but I also it'd be nice to have a really robust you know, regional representation of artists, maybe that we could ship to other places as well to do, do work and that sort of thing. Mm. I, I love the idea of and wherever possible, I've seen several strategies and tactics over the years and I'm always looking for more. It, it has an effect on um, coming from funding, but also the scale of projects I think can have a big impact 
But I think when you're in a role where you are facilitating public art in an ongoing basis, I believe it's really essential to consider the ways in which you're creating building blocks for the artists in your area, because it, it simply doesn't make sense for somebody who's only ever completed a $20,000 project to suddenly get a $300,000 project. The skill level, that's a, a large growth, unless perhaps you have ways to bring some other professionals in who can support around that in that budget. That would be another way. But I think where we can, it's essential to support local artists in whatever way we can. And I think one of the ways to do that is to give them growth opportunities so that we are increasing our market's ability to create artwork locally and exactly to make them more competitive as they're looking to like go out otherwise. I do also think it's valuable to all of us to have kind of that flow, getting, getting artists in Iowa to be able to do their work outside of the state is good for their careers. It's good for those other communities. And then having artists who are coming in from other places, they're coming from completely different cultures. Um, even just artists working in Iowa City versus in Des Moines, there's a different kind of flavor to that. And I think if we are able to benefit and be inspired by artists who are coming from other places, that's of a benefit to our local artists too. It shows them where they can dream to head towards. Do you think um, there's a role, you know, we um, partnered with the University of Iowa um, Office for Sustainable Communities, you know, they provided some assistance to us. Um, do you think there's a role for the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs to um, help make more connections, especially among um, some of the smaller communities with less wherewithal? I believe they have some programs that seek to do that. Uh, the, the Great Places is kind of the tail end of that destination, but there's, um, I wanna say John, his last name is not coming to me, but there, there is a dedicated staff person at the Iowa Arts Council whose role is to go to different communities statewide and help them problem solve and figure out how to incorporate the arts in their public life. Yeah. How about through the rest of you? But I, I'm curious to hear more on how um, how difficult it is to sustain uh, a healthy population of artists for for the needs that we have with public art. Uh, you know, I, I I I don't know if I have the answer to that. You know, it's you know I think it's I know it's constantly a, a work in progress. I like what Matt said about like you know these growth areas and um, uh, you know Iowa City is a different place in Des Moines, like like you said. And so in Iowa City we have this you know transient population where every three or four years we have a whole new uh, you know fraction of the population that's turning over, and so that brings that brings some change, but it's, but it also has a lot of people leaving. So, um, you know, I, I think it starts with some of these base things, just like, uh, you know, making sure the cities and companies that uh, can support this kind of work, support it and grow from a young age, you know, like, like who, who has some of these skills. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I, Add, there's a couple of things. There's supporting artists in general. Not all artists want to work in the public realm, right? So looking for kind of that ecosystem of support that puts some rungs on the ladder for all artists that maybe want to show work or they just want to extend their work or they, they just want to sell work, right? Like that's there's lots of different avenues and we don't have that infrastructure even in Des Moines, right? There's not anyone helping create those lat that ladder of support. The state really is is the only one. And it isn't enough um, for what I think we see for needs here. For artists working in the public realm, I think it, there isn't enough artists and I do think it's on all of us as practitioners um, as has been alluded to, to create opportunities of support, to create opportunities, whether it's mentorship, paid mentorships, working alongside experienced artists or also creating, you know, smaller options that could lead to bigger ones. So, it, and it's not only, number of artists, but the diversity of artists, who's getting those calls. I mean, when you start to look at 
larger projects, it gets very white, very male, very quickly. So I also think paying good, close attention to what we all can do to can create that diverse pool um, and advocating for programs within our community, you know, as, as practitioners, that maybe we can't do it all, but we can be there as advocates to make sure that there are those systems of support that get created as well. Yeah. yeah. We have a question from our audience. Um, how can we establish some funding and best practices for starting more artist in residence programs to bring more artists here and showcase the potential? That's a, I'm hoping we can discuss that for a while. I do think artists in residence programs are a really powerful way to accomplish all of what we're talking about and they can be custom fit. There's a wide range of ways to do residents, uh, artists in residence with different, for different goals, with different levels of investment. Um, but maybe just to go back for a second, the Iowa Arts Council does also offer their annual fellowships and project grants for organizations and project grants for individuals. And in those ways, they also are supporting artists, whether they work in the public sphere or otherwise. And when their, their fellowship program is really exceptional, they take those artists, they get uh, career training and development advice, and they get money to support their studio practice. And then they tour the state of Iowa and they talk about their work in public gatherings, which both helps them learn how to present and talk about their work, but it also exposes them all around the state. Mm -hmm. For artists in residency, I feel like for more of that to happen, we just, people need examples of it. People need to see it piloted in their community and then peers within those organizations, whether it's government institution or nonprofit, are talking to their peers about the impact of having an artist in residency. We worked, we, Bravo is a local funder, arts and culture funder. They wanted to pilot artists in residency because they specifically wanted to see more artists in residencies happening in government. So we work with them to facilitate that. So just getting a few funders to pilot it in various communities and the folks who host them to talk to their colleagues about the power of the artists being in their organization. It's really that peer-to-peer -peer connection um, that will be key, I think, in getting people to believe in um, what artists can do when they're embedded in non-traditional spaces. Mm -hmm. 